Hello everyone, this is Maryam and we are group 16. My group mates are Roxana, Sohela and Hamid. We are going to talk about CloudScope, which is a nested virtual machine based rootkit and its detection. Let's have an introduction and get familiar with this topic. The most important step after exploiting vulnerabilities and compromise a computer system is retain the control of the system and avoid detection. To achieve this goal, there are various rootkits. But existing rootkits can be detected as soon as defenders set up a detection mechanism at a low lower layer, because the lower layers of a computer system can easily control the upper layers. So, the battle between attackers and defenders is that which side can gain control at the lower layer of a system. Based on what I explained in the previous slide, we have two goals in this paper. We can see it from the attacker's perspective and from the defender's perspective. First, we assume an attacker's role and explore the possibility of building a new type of rootkit, which is not visible to defensive tools running at a lower layer. In particular, we propose CloudSculk, which is a nested virtual machine-based rootkit that targets a virtualized system, especially in cloud environments. The, the key feature of CloudSculk is that the rootkit is inserted in between the guest operating system and the original hypervisor. Uh, CloudSculk is stealthier and harder to detect. It is rooted in the fact that the inserted rootkit in the middle is able to not only impersonate the original hypervisor to communicate with the original guest operating system, but also impersonate the original guest operating system to communicate with the original hypervisor. To address this new security challenge, we then assume the defender's role and propose an effective detection approach. From the defender's perspective, we present and implement a memory duplication-based host-level det uh, detection approach, and our experimental results demonstrate that the proposed method can effectively detect nested virtual machine-based rootkits. There are two enabling techniques for our CloudSculk rootkit. First, VM live migration, and the second is nested virtualization. In this section, we first describe these two techniques and then we present our threat model. In the previous works, uh, define VM live migration as a procedure of migrating an entire OS and all of its applications as one unit from one host machine to another host machine. The second technique is nested virtualization. Have you heard about it? It's a technology that allows multiple hypervisors to run on top of the same hypervisor at the same time. Unlike traditional virtualization, where multiple operating systems run on top of the same hypervisor, nested virtualization takes it up a notch by allowing multiple hypervisors run on top of the same hypervisor simultaneously. So, the idea of nested virtualization is running a hypervisor inside a virtual machine. This type of virtualization has gained its popularity since 2010 when researchers from IBM for the first time implemented nested virtualization in their Turtles projects. In the Turtle projects, uh, they introduced the concept of level 0, level 1, and level 2. For designing the threat model, uh, we should consider that the major function of rootkits is to retain the control of a compromised victim system without being detected. We would like to emphasize that taking control and retaining that control are two separate tasks to attackers, and both of them are equally critical to attackers. For any rootkits related research, it is common to assume that the task of taking control has already been done. In other words, attackers have already compromised a victim system. Previous studies have talked about different ways attackers can gain ele uh, elevated privileges on a system, and many of those techniques can be used in cloud environments too. But in addition to those, there is another way attackers can exploit a vulnerability called a VMscape vulnerability. This type of vulnerability happens when there is a weakness in the communication between the guest operating system and the hypervisor in a virtual machine, and it allows attackers to escape from the VM. VM escape vulnerabilities have become pretty well known in recent years. For example, we can see in the table that the first virtual machine escape exploit against VMware ESXi implemented in 2019. So let's say that attackers assume they've already gained access to the system and they want to evade detection while creating a rootkit. 
They can do this by creating their own virtual machines and using VM Live migration to move them around. They would make their own hypervisor L1 act as a malicious guest hypervisor and put the victim's virtual machine L2 inside it. This way they can run even more virtual machines inside L2 making it even harder to detect. To make sure they don't get caught, they'll avoid uh, making any changes to the L1 hypervisor's kernel level code. Virtualization is often used to monitor and protect the integrity of guest operating system kernel code. But in this scenario, uh, attackers are using it to create and install a cloud skulk rootkit, which we'll explain more about it in section 3 and 4. Hello, this is Sorela and I wanted to talk about design and implementation of cloud skulk. It is based on the Linux kernel-based virtual machine hypervisor. As we learned before, KVM has a type 1 hypervisor and guest VMs are virtualized based on hardware level support found in modern CPU virtualization extensions. Also, every VM is implemented as a regular Linux process and is scheduled by the standard Linux scheduler. To create and launch VM, typically a user level tool called Quick Emulator is used. The presented rootkit was performed on a Linux platform that hosts the QEMU KVM software pattern. It enables nested hypervisor and is used for live migration. Also, it is popular and flexible in its implementation. But what's the process of an attack? An attacker, like normal customer, can rent a VM in a cloud environment. The attacker's VM and many other VMs are all on the same host machine. In the figure, guest M is the VM owned by attacker and guest 0 is a target VM. Attacker can take advantage of existing vulnerabilities in a hypervisor and able to break out of its VM and gain privilege control on the host. Notice that they do not need to break out of a VM if a remote vulnerability exists on a host system. The attacker gain privilege control over the host and can launch a new virtual machine like this figure that they run guest X which is a rootkit in the middle. Then attacker can launch a VM inside guest X. Finally, attacker can migrate to guest X using the nested virtualization techniques and kill the original VM. The main advantage is that it is a still C. We can consider this feature in different perspectives. First, VM's owner, who does not observe any obvious behavior change because port forwarding is used by the attacker and we cannot use technique of detecting virtualization here. But the additional layer of virtualization will affect the performance. From system admin's perspective, guest X now is considered as guest zero. And finally about attackers, attacker can ensure that guest X and guest zero are using the same virtualized devices. With a complete uh, control inside guest X, the attacker has sufficient power to tamper with various virtual machine introspection techniques. But when attacker are control um, the guest kernel by manipulating various kernel data structure, attacker can uh, subvert existing VMI tools. The consequence is attacker will be able to hide their activities in a guest operating system. But what about PID? Is this the same? No, there is not the same. If the system administrator monitor PID, they can find the difference. But PID is just a variable in a memory. An attacker can first kill guest 0 and then change the PID of a guest X. Implementation has a five step. In first step, live migration required to create a destination VM with the same configuration as a source. So they need some information and they can use history command line process status and uh, using QEMU monitoring to gather data. Then a rootkit can be created. The guest VM environment within a rootkit is provided with its own hypervisor and the ability to nest VMs. If necessary, the OS on the rootkit can be changed. The third step is creation of a nested VM. The live migration destination VM is nested. It is necessary to add a specific parameters to destination VM, so they should be appended such that it is paused in an incoming state and it will be listening for migration data. Invoking the live migration utility using the QEMU monitor is a fourth step. 
there are several methods to open the target VMs um, QEMU monitor depending on how emulated. It depends on how the rootkit, nested VM and live migration command related to each other. For example, if the target VM's QEMU monitor is multiplexed on another serial port such as a telnet server listening on a special port, then telnet on a host side could be invoked to open it. And finally, clean up a step. This could be achieved by ending the Linux process and pass target virtual machine on a host side or utilizing a QEMU monitor command. Now attacker can run two groups of malicious services in a rootkit, active and passive. In passive services, attacker can monitor the event and activity and traffic and even use VMI technique to serve its malicious goal. And in active service, attacker can manipulate the packet from and to the victim system, such as modify certain email message. Hello, I'm Hamid. The evaluation of a cloud SCALT rootkit includes two parts. Show a successful implementation on the platform as they targeted cloud environment. Number two, show the rootkit's ability to remain unnoticed by a target guest user numerically. The experiments performed on a testbed running Fedora 22 OS with Linux kernel 4.4.14 with two guests, L1 and L2. L0, L1 and L2 have the following install configurations. To show installation of a cloud skull, they can assume the attacker gained control of a house system. If the attack includes only one physical machine, the attacker can install the rootkit in less than one minute. Macro benchmarks As there is no fixed threshold to define the levels of remaining unnoticed or defines the maximum duration of installation, they focus on characterizing both the performance degradation caused by RITM and its, its installation time cost. They just follow the best effort practice ideology by choosing a common cloud guest user. And in this case, the guest user's workload is the variable that will play a significant role in performance and migration timing. Therefore, assuming a cloud guest user with a static, a static configuration, they can characterize both the performance degradation and live migration. Performance degradation and live migration timing affected by two types of generalized activity that the user can perform. CPU memory intensive workloads and network intensive workloads. To evaluate their focus on number one, they chose to collect Linux kernel compile times for the same three execution environments. L0, L1, and L2. Process is CPU and memory native. A bash shell script. L0 for all tests, decompressed and compiled. Linux kernel version 4.0.5. As you can see in this bar chart, after the rootkit is installed, a targeted guest user will experience a 25.7% decrease in speed associated with the kernel compile type of CPU memory workloads. For second performance, an open source benchmark NetPerf is used. For the test, they chose to measure the bulk data transfer performance or unidirectional stream performance of TCP and a bash shell script. Data labels here show the percentage decrease in latency with respect to the layer below it. With the standard deviations higher than the percentage differences in throughput, they conclude that this performance is nearly the same across all the execution environments. The results show that their proposed cloud SCALT rootkit can effectively remain undetected from a target user in a cloud environment in which similar network workloads are running. Last evaluation. This test, characterizing the live migration timing of a guest user performing various types of workloads, idle, Linux kernel compiles, and file bench to represent IO intensive workload. For this testing, two levels of live migrations have been chosen to characterize L0 to L0 and L0 to L1. And here you can see the result. The bottommost set of data labels show the numerical values associated with the each end to end time. And the topmost set shows the percentage increase in end to end time. The bottommost set of data labels are important because these values allow us to determine our cloud SCAL installation time. Therefore, the best in installation time of a cloud SCAL rootkit is about 26 seconds and when a target guest user is performing IO intensive workloads is 29 seconds and for CPU memory intensive workloads the time is about uh, 820 seconds. To perform a number of micro benchmark tests LMH3 was chosen as our micro benchmark 
As shown in these tables, virtualization has negligible effect on all arithmetic operations. Also, for file creation and deletion operations, L2 and L1 performance match the baseline. For example, the L0 performance. For process operations, process fork generates peak performance overhead in L2. Everyone, this is Roxana. To detect a cloud scout rootkit, it is crucial to identify the nested virtualization environment and the existence of the L1 hypervisor. Detecting this can be done either within L2 or within L0. However, if the detection is launched and controlled by the user, deploying the detection approach in L2 is more preferable. This is because a detection launched by a system administrator could raise privacy concerns for VM users such as cloud customers. However, it's important to note that since L2 is under the control of L1, attackers from L1 could monitor and uh, manipulate events and timing measurements in L2. Therefore, instead of running a detection uh, module at L2, the authors propose deploying the detection mechanism at L0 to avoid such uh, manipulation. Detecting a cloud scout rootkit in the L0 environment is a complex task because attackers who are in control of L1 can impersonate the victim's virtual machine by running the same operating system and application as the victim. This means that existing virtual machine introspection techniques that simply scan the memory of the virtual machine aren't sufficient. Therefore, a detection mechanism based on a memory saving technique called memory deduplication is proposed. Memory deduplication reduces memory or overhead in virtualized environments and uh, is widely used by mainstream hypervisors such as VMware and Microsoft Hyper-V. The detection mechanism is built by selecting unique memory pages in L2, such as a unique file loaded in L2's memory, using memory deduplication. The selected file, called file A, exists only once in the memory, and its size can be up to 400 kilobytes, assuming that the attacker in uh, control of L1 wants to impersonate L2. It is assumed that file A also exists in in L1's memory. The detection approach involves the following steps. Step 1. File A is loaded into L0's memory and is allowed to merge with the copy in L2 or L1. The write access time to each page of file A is tested and recorded, represented as T1. Step 2. Each page of file A in L2 is slightly modified to create a new version of the file called file A version 2. File A is then loaded into L0's memory again, and the write access time to each page of file A is tested and recorded, represented as T2. If L1 doesn't exist, then T1 should be significantly larger than T2, because in step 1, there are two copies of file A, one in L2 and one in L0. Thus, T1 represents the write access time to merged pages, whereas T2 represents the write access time to regular pages. However, if L1 exists, then T1 shouldn't be significantly different from T2, because in step 2, file A in L0 should still be merged with file A in L1. Thus, T2 represents the write access time to merge pages. The proposed detection approach uses memory de duplication to detect the existence of L1 in the nested virtualization environment. By selecting a unique file and monitoring the write access time to its pages, the approach can identify whether an attacker is impersonating the victim's virtual machine. The others have implemented a detection module using the C programming language. The primary function of this module is to load a specified file into memory, wait for a specified amount of time, and then test and record the write access time to each page of the file. The detection module runs in L0 and gathers all the necessary data. Additionally, they have developed a program that runs in L2, which can load a file into memory and make changes to each page of the file when required. Their evaluation involves two steps. Uh, they perform the evaluation in two scenarios, scenario 1 where L1 doesn't exist and 2 where L1 does exist. For both scenarios, they measure uh, T1 and T2 and use a randomly chosen MP3 music file, file A. For demonstration purpose, they also collect T0, which represents the time it takes to load file A into L0's memory, but not in any virtual machine's memory. They test and record the write access time to each page of file A. They consider this T0 as the baseline case. In figure 
17, which shows the results without a nested virtual machine, T1 is significantly larger than T2, which is also similar to T0, as expected. The result of scenario 2 with a nested virtual machine is shown in figure 18. As anticipated, there is no significant difference between T1 and T2. However, both are considerably larger than T0. These results demonstrate that their detection approach via memory du duplication can effectively detect a cloud-stuck rootkit. Although attackers can theoretically modify the same file in both L1 and L2 layers of a virtual machine, it would not help them evade detection. This is because defenders can use just one or a few pages to detect the presence of the rootkit. And synchronizing millions or billions of L2 pages in L1 would be too expensive. The authors also discuss two major requirements of their proposed detection approach. File A should appear in both L0 and L2, and L1 should contain the same file in its memory as L2 for virtual machine introspection tools to work effectively. They conclude that their proposed approach can effectively detect cloud skulk rootkits without introducing any new uh, attacking surface. Thank you for joining us today and we look forward to any further discussions we may have.